Stephen said, I'm just so proud to be here. Yeah. Hardly anybody ever get, I guess that wasn't a popular song, but hardly anybody. I mean, I'm really, in, I'm really sincere, and I'm glad to make it crystal yeah. clear. Hardly anybody ever catch that when I say that. It's an age thing. Yeah. yeah. Shows you how old I am. Well, um, so, yeah, if you're a Ray Stevens fan, as I am, I'm an avid Ray Stevens fan. And uh, so, yeah, that was a good song. Everything is beautiful in its own way. All right, back to reality. Okay, so first of all, just a couple announcements. This Thursday night, we're not going to have a church because everybody's going to be gone. Okay, so so it's 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 going. I'm my wife and I are going to be on vacation. Mom and Dad's going to be gone. And, uh, and so, you know, Tommy, Tommy's going to be gone, and so, you know, it, it, and he's my stand-in, so we, we're just going to call off. Y'all take the night off and enjoy yourselves. Go, go, go to the state house and get you a steak to celebrate on Thursday night, all right? And enjoy yourselves, amen? Don't, remember, don't forget that, uh, and it's the bottom of your notes, uh, April the 8th, we are having a Resurrection Day celebration here at the church. Uh, we're going to be asking for people to help us warm up the food that we have, uh, that Brian and Jenny have blessed us with. And so we have plenty of food uh, for everybody. We're going to take volunteers with good ovens to warm that food up and bring it. And we're going to have a big feast and celebrate Resurrection Day. And then, of course, the next day is Easter. And then at the bottom of your notes, I believe it's in June, the first Saturday in June, I think. But you'll see the date at the bottom of your notes when you pull out your note sheet. Uh, we've got a family, church-wide family picnic at Don Carter State Park. So don't forget about that. And uh, we'll talk about details of that a little bit later on. Are y'all glad to be here this morning? Amen. It's, uh, it's, it's, it looks like it's going to be a little bit of rain coming down just a little bit. It's nice and dry in here. But I'm hoping for not a dry service. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's let the Holy Spirit have his way. Father, we thank you so much thank that you've you, given us you, your day to worship you. This is the day the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we thank you that we are here and we are two or three are gathered, two or more gathered together in your name, Jesus. You promised us that you would be in the midst. So we're asking you to make yourself at home in this service. Holy Spirit, you have the calm. You take over. This is all you. And I make sure that the Father is happy with what he had experiences today in his house. And we thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. Amen. Pull out your little red folder. Little red folder. And open it up and find the song, I Am Blessed. I have no idea what page it is because mine doesn't have a number on it. Little red folder right there. I Am Blessed. And let's praise God for how blessed we are. We are living in a blessed land. Thank you, Jesus. I am blessed. Sing it like you mean it.
This fellow walked out, or a kid, this was on a high school, a, 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 a playground in the schoolyard. And this, this fellow walks out the playground schoolyard. He's a new guy. This is his first or second day of school. And he walks out there, and there's this guy that everybody has told him is the class bull. Everybody know about the class bull? Yeah. Okay. And he's the guy that beats everybody up, takes some lunch money. And he sees him sitting down on a bench. Everybody's up playing and doing everything, but he's sitting on a bench, and he's got a notebook, and he's writing and this fellow walks up to him and introduces himself to him and says, I'm the new guy here. He says, I'm just curious about what you're doing. The bully looks up at him and says, this is my notebook of names of everybody that I know I can beat up and bully and take their lunch money. He says, let me see that book. He looks at it and says, you can mark my name off of that. And the bully looks at him and says, yes, sir, and marks his name off. <laughs> do you understand that? Oh, yeah. All he had to do was look him in the eye and say, you can mark my name off that book. I want you to look the devil square in the eye. Amen. And I want you to look at him knowing that I, the Father, is standing right behind you. Hallelujah. And you tell him, devil, you can mark my name off your list. Amen. Say it with me. Devil, you can mark my name off your list. Because God is on my side. I have sheep on my feet.
open the floodgates of heaven. You are pour out your blessing upon us greater than what we can contain. And you said that you would rebuke the devourer for our sake. He shall not destroy the fruits of our ground, neither will our vine give up her fruit in the field before it's time. And all people are going to look at us and say, man, that's a bunch of blessed folks because God is so good to them. And everybody said amen. Amen. amen.
good looking they are. Tell them how much weight they've lost this morning. Everybody needs to hear that. They just praise God for a minute with a brother or sister. Thank you, Jesus.
So today we humble ourselves before you and we open our ears and our hearts to receive your word. We're asking you for your spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge and that our eyes will be enlightened with your light so that we can receive what is on your heart. Thank you for sharing it with us and thank you for revealing yourself to us. And we receive no distractions this morning. We bind every satanic spirit that would cause any distraction in this place or hinder our understanding in any way. And in Jesus' name we pray it. And everybody said, Amen. amen. And Amen. Mark 16. Reading out of the New Living, we're going to start at verse 14. Jesus is speaking. And John is narrating. And John narrated, still later, he, Jesus, appeared to the eleven disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn unbelief. Because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. Verse 15. He then told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. I'd like you to read that with me together. Ready, read. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who are called to be evangelists and preachers. Is that what it says? Those who what? Believe. What is the qualification for these miraculous signs? Those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if, everybody say if, if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Verse 19. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the place of honor at God's right hand. Remember what I told you last week. Jesus is where? In heaven. The only way that you have the presence of Jesus in your heart is through the Holy Spirit. When you get born again, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes in. And he connects us with Jesus and the Father. All right? So, verse 19, when he had sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand, verse 20, and the disciples went everywhere and preached. And the Lord worked what? Through them. Through them. How do they say through them? Say it out loud, through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Now, I want you to pay close attention. Let's look at verse 20 again. And the disciples went everywhere and preached, and who worked? The Lord. The Lord worked through them, confirming what they said with many miraculous signs. Now, in the King James... If you have the King James, look at verse 20 in the King James. It says, they went forth and they preached everywhere, the Lord, the Lord working with, notice how them is in italics. Does everybody in King James have them in italics? Yeah. The reason why them is in italics is because the King James scholars were trying to translate ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek into their modern day English, which was Elizabethan English in the 1600s, which now is ancient English to us. So when they come across a phrase or a word that did not translate well, they would step back, so to speak, and look at the scripture as a whole, and they would add in a word that would make the, the translation smooth. Everybody understand this? They weren't trying to change the meaning. They were just trying to help the translation from ancient Hebrew and Greek into their language because the, a lot of times the ancient languages or in, in, in languages in other nations don't translate very well into English because English is one of the hardest languages there is to translate into. Because English is so messed up. Okay? So, they put the them in. We can leave the them out. If you leave the them out, it helps you to understand what was originally said. And you're not changing the word by leaving the them out, but it clarifies it even more if you leave it out. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with and confirming what? Aha! The Lord was working with and confirming the word with signs following. Yes, he was working with them, but he was working with the word. Now, let's 
your notes. The King James translated directly at the top of your page, and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord God working with and confirming the word with signs following. The Lord God working. Now we learned last week, we know the Trinity, we've all been taught the Trinity, and we understand that the Trinity is, of course, three different Godhead individuals. You have Jehovah, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, if you translate the Holy Spirit with his name originally from the original Hebrew as it was stated in Genesis and as it's stated here, because this was from Hebrew, then Greek, then English, you'll look at it and it says, the Lord working actually is translated as Ruach Hayal, which means the working spirit of God, the third member of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the working member of the Trinity. He's the one who is the energizing spirit. He energizes, he works, and remember we studied it last week in the Trinity, in the creation, the Je Jehovah, our Father, spoke, Jesus the Word, I mean, thought, Jesus the Word spoke, the Holy Spirit worked. Our Father desired light, the Word spoke, light be, the Holy Spirit flipped the switch. Everybody understand that? Okay. So the Holy Spirit is the working member of the Trinity. Now, if you look at the verse 20 in King James directly translated, it says, They went forth, the disciples, they preached everywhere, the Lord God working with them. The Lord God working, He was with them, and He was confirming the Word. Well, who is the Word? It's the Word. Jesus, the Word. Look at the next line down. The Word is a Greek term, logos, living Word. And it talks about the essential Word of God, who is Jesus Christ. He is the personal wisdom and power in union with God. He is the minister of creation. And everything that happened, happened because Jesus spoke it. He spoke the word, the Holy Spirit, the working spirit of God made it happen. So all the Father thought it or desired it. Jesus spoke it. Holy Spirit made it happen. All right? Now, look at the remember. Remember, the Holy Spirit is a member of the Holy Trinity. It's impossible to single out one member without including every member because they all three work so close in agreement, relationship, and fellowship that they live, act, and work as individual units. Or as, as an individual unit. Next bullet point. In every act of the Trinity, God Jehovah thinks, God the Word speaks, God the Spirit works, and it is so. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes His mode of operation. Now look at 2 Corinthians 3 and 5 here in your notes. It is not that we think we're qualified to do anything on our own. Everybody say amen to that. Because Jesus said, apart from me, you can what? Do nothing. Our qualification comes from who? From God. He has enabled us to be ministers of the new covenant. This is a new covenant not written of laws, but of who? The Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death. But under the new covenant, the Spirit gives what? Life and life more abundantly. Jesus said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. How does he do that? Through the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the energizing spirit. He is the working spirit. He's the one that energizes our salvation. Now, let's look at the heading. The Holy Spirit lives in every born-again believer and identifies them as a child of the Heavenly Father. Now, if you still got Romans 8 tag. Let's go to it, and let's read out of Romans 8. Romans 8, I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read out of the New Living, because it flows very well. Romans 8, verse 1. Is everybody there? Say amen. amen. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit. Who is that? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. The working spirit. The power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. 
And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Everybody say, our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. We, for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow who? The Spirit. The Spirit. He's in us. We follow Him. He's the guiding one. He's guiding us. He is the Spirit of grace. Verse 5. Those who are dominated by their sinful nature think about sinful things. Those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Now, the first thing we've got to understand is you have to let the Spirit have control. Now, this has been something that has been people have been afraid of, of the Holy Spirit. They've been afraid. Many times I've heard people say, I don't want to be baptized by the Holy Spirit because I don't want Him to make me do something I don't want to do. That ain't never going to happen. Never going to happen. He is the most gentleman-like being you've ever come in contact with. Trust me, if he could make you not sin, you'd never sin. Because he's living in you, right? When you got born again, he's the one who moved in. So if he could control you, you'd never sin another day in your life. Amen? Because he would make you be righteous. He would make you never sin. But every one of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. Every day. Sometimes more than once a day. I know I do. I'm constantly having to say, oh, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. All the time. I mean, it happens. Okay? And I pray, the Holy Spirit, help me. You know, get me out of that. You know, help me not to do that no more. Oh, don't let me think that stupid thought again. You know, it's just a call me on the Holy Spirit constantly. You know, and the Holy Spirit's helping me. But see, if he could make you do anything, he would. But he can't, so he don't. So don't ever let anybody tell you the Holy Spirit can make you speak in tongues, because he can't. And he won't. You don't want to speak in tongues, you ain't never going to speak in tongues. And it's your prerogative. And God don't think less of you if you don't. Some of the religions might beat you over the head, but we ain't religious in this church, are we? No. Okay. The tongues is a gift. Everybody say it's a gift. If I give you a gift and you don't want it, you're going to what? Regift it. Amen? Give it to somebody else. Okay. So don't think God's going to shove anything down your throat. He's going to, not going to force you to do anything. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that He takes you and shakes you whenever He wants you to do something. He's there to guide you. He's there to help you. He's there to energize you. The Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. Everybody say, He's good. He's good. And He's exceptionally good to me. Good. Now, verse 9. You are not controlled by your sinful nature, but you are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you even though your body will die because of sin. The Spirit gives you life. That's how Christ lives within us. Because the Spirit gives you the life He said He would give. Because you have been made right with God. Verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God, and just as God raised Jesus from the dead... He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. And I know this is the truth because I had to ask Him, Resurrection Spirit, put that resurrection power in me this morning and get me up out of this bed. Because I had trouble getting up. And He helped me get up out of the bed. Amen? I depend on the Holy Spirit to give motion to these bones and muscles a lot of times. Because they're weak. Amen? So he will. Verse 12. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death your deeds of the sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are who? Children, Children of God. Uh -huh. So that you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now, when did that happen? When you were born again. When you asked Jesus, Jesus, I'm, I'm a sinner. I need you in my heart. I ask you to come in and wash me in your blood and make me a new creature. I want to live for you. Immediately, the Holy Spirit comes in and God says, That's my son. That's my daughter. I claim them now. I'm adopting them. They're mine. So immediately, you belong to Him. You're no longer the devil's. You're God's child. 
He immediately puts the Holy Spirit in you, which is His own DNA. And if anybody checks your spiritual blood, they're going to see you got your daddy's blood in you. Amen? Your spiritual dad. So if we could have spiritual blood, it would show up that our spiritual dad is our bloodline. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of adoption. He's the one that lets us know, I now belong to God. I belong to Him. He and I are one. Now let's go on. Verse 16. For the Spirit, for His Spirit joins... Now wait a minute. Go back up. God's Spirit, when He adopted us as His own children, now we call Him Abba Father. Everybody say, Abba Father. Abba Father. That was important. We don't want to forget that. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm... That we are who? God's children. The Holy Spirit, He affirms that and confirms it. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share His glory, we must also share His what? Oh, oh, okay. Quick pro quo. All right, so now look at the bottom of page 1 in your notes. Ephesians 1, 5a, 13b through 14. I bunched some scriptures together to make a flow. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Read the pink with me. Ready, read. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. So now, that, the Holy Spirit is your identification with God. It means you're authentic. You're bona fide. So, verse 14. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised that he purchased us to be his own people, and he did this so we would praise and glorify him. Turn the page over. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. What well, meaneth this? So let's look at this and see what God means. Mark 16, 16. Anyone. What does anyone mean? Everybody. Anyone. Everybody qualifies. Anyone who believes and is baptized. What? We'll be saved. Now, let's break it down. Verse 16. Believes. Believes means to think, to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, to place total confidence in, to give over complete control. In other words, God, I'm giving you my life. I want you to control the outcome of it. And he controls, we go to heaven. Amen? We're no longer going to hell, we're going to heaven. And anything else you give in control of. See, it's the thing. God will not take control. You have to give him control. Because we, we talked about that a few moments ago. You have to give God control. I, keep, I hear people say this all the time about the world situation. Well, God's in control. He ain't no more in control than you are. It comes as a shock to each other. You know what God's in control of? What you pray about. If you ain't praying about it, it's running on its own. And Satan's got me if it's in this world. Don't buy into that religious bullpen. God is not sovereign over the world. He gave the world to Adam, and Adam forfeited it to Satan. Yep. Jesus predicted all these things are going to happen. And he told it to multiple people so that there would be multiple witnesses. And the best description of it is in the book of Revelation. But it doesn't mean God's in control. He predicted everything we knuckleheads were going to allow to happen on this planet. And I digress. Now, anyone who believes and is baptized, because we need to stay on baptism or else I'll get on politics. <laughs> baptized. This word is translated from two separate Greek words, bato and baptizo. Both words mean total immersion, but with two different results. The clearest example that shows the meaning of baptism is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander, who lived about 200 B.C. It is a recipe for making what? Everybody say it again. It is a recipe for making pickles. And is helpful because it uses both words. Nicander said that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable must first be dipped, bato, into boiling water, and then baptized in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersion of vegetables in a solution. Now let's look at this. 
Here we have what? You see my bowl? Okay. And we have cucumbers. <laughs> They're pitiful little cucumbers, because that's all Kroger had. Okay? But I promise you, they're cucumbers. Now, this cucumber, both of them are a little dirty. They got some dirt on them. This has got a little bit of a flower left on it, on the tip. So, baptized is two baptisms. This little cucumber, both of these little cucumbers, they came to the altar. They gave their life to God. They surrendered their life to Jesus and asked Jesus to come into their heart. And then they said, we want to be baptized. So then, the preacher takes them down to the lake, dips them in water, all right? And that water is representative of the blood of Jesus Christ. And what that water does is it cleanses them on the outside. Now, the water ain't going to do a thing to the inside of that, of, of that cucumber, is it? Yeah. It ain't going to get in there at all. All it does is it washes off the outside. When you come up out of being baptized, the only thing changed about you is you're wet. <laughs> And depending on where you got baptized, you may be muddy. Okay? But what it is, it is to significant, it is to significant, uh, signify what the blood of Jesus has done to you. The blood of Jesus has taken you from being dirty to being clean. Everybody understand that? The blood of Jesus gets you clean. Now you're no longer going to hell. Now, as God says, these two cucumbers are mine. God's claimed them, these are my children. These are Christians. They're born again, child of God. But they're still cucumbers. They're going to heaven. Right? Yeah. They're going to heaven. Completely saved, guaranteed to go to heaven. They're going to heaven. But they're going to heaven as cucumbers. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of Christian cucumbers in church right now. They're going to heaven, but they don't look and act are taught much different than they did before they got saved. They don't think a lot different. You get them behind the wheel, they're still basically the same. Okay? Somebody makes them mad, they still cut you out. They love Jesus, they love you, but they'll cut you out. Okay? They'll push you in front of you at the buffet. Or they'll get really mad at you if you jump in front of them. But they're saved. They're going, they're going to heaven. Okay? God loves them. He calls them his own. But they ain't been changed yet. Everybody understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. Because there is a change that happens to a person as you become baptized in the Holy Spirit and you change internally. Yeah. Because now, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you become one of these. Now this is one of my favorite things. This is a pickle. It's a jar of pickle. Now, these look drastically different than these, don't they? Trust me. You bite into this, and you bite into this, the flavor is totally different. Amen? This is going to make you smile. This is going to make you go, whoo. But this is going to make you smile. This is going to bless your heart. This might cuss you out. Still going to heaven. Still a child of God. But this ain't going to cuss you out. This is going to love you. This is going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. This is going to bear the mark that God has put on it. Amen? Because look at the rest of this. Last three lines. Last four lines. Negator says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable must be dipped in boiling water, then baptized in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersion of the vegetables in a solution. The first is temporary. The second, the act of baptizing the vegetable produces a what? Say that again out loud. Permanent change. This can never go back to this. Ever. Once this happens, it's a pickle forever. And the longer you leave it in the solution, the better it gets. Amen? This is from 2022. These are last year's pickles. I got some from 2021. Them's real good. Amen? These are percolating just fine. But those 2021s, woo-wee! They've had time for some of these peppers to get in there and the spices. And what happens? The salt gets in the pickle. It gets in the cucumber. The salt gets in it. The vinegar gets in it. The spices get in it. It changes it. And it makes it a pickle instead of a cucumber. 
Amen. Amen. Now, let's go on. <laughs> Look at your bullet point. When a believer is born again, the first baptism is being dipped to water to signify the cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb. The second baptism is living in a state of immersion in what? The presence of the Holy Spirit and being changed into the likeness of our Creator. The Holy Spirit permeates us with His divine nature so that we become just like Jesus, our divine example. Y'all realize that we studied the fruit of the Spirit for about four weeks before we studied the baptism of the Spirit, right? Yeah. There's a reason for that. Because God is way more interested in the baptism making you fruit than the baptism making you speak in tongues. Y'all having a hard time digesting that pickle? Amen? Now, here's why. Let's look at saved. What does it mean to be saved? Look at the word saved. It is a Greek word, sozo. And what it means is to heal. To protect, deliver, protect, to heal, preserve. What are pickles? They preserve what? You know. They preserve. To save, to do well, to make whole. Everybody say whole. We are a wholeness church. Not holiness. Nothing wrong with holiness, but we're a wholeness church. Our church doctrine states that we're a wholeness church. We believe from Genesis to Revelation the whole thing, and we teach and preach the whole thing, and do our best to live by the whole thing. Because you've got to understand what a denomination is. A denomination, a denomination is not wrong, it's just only part. Yeah. Right? The largest denomination we have monetarily is a $100 bill. So let's say, and I've showed you this before, let's say that God's Word is the $100 bill. And let's say that these denominations, the 50s, the 20s, the 10s, the 5s, and the 1s, and then you go down into what? 50 cents. Do they make those anymore? You can find them. 50 cent piece, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. All right? So all of those are part of the whole. The penny's not wrong. It's money just like the $100 bill is. Amen? Yeah. But it's only a very small part of the whole $100 bill. The denominations only teach part of the Word of God. They only believe part of the Word of God. They only want part of the Word of God. They only desire part of the blessing of God. We teach the hundred dollar bill. I want it all. Yeah. I believe in it all. I want to live it all. I don't want anything left out. If it belongs to me, you better believe I'm going to get it. I'm going to do my best to get it if it belongs to me. Amen? Amen? Jesus went to a lot of trouble to make sure that every bit of this is mine. Matter of fact, he gave his life died on the cross, and went to hell, spent three days there, and come back alive by the power of the Holy Spirit, went to heaven and come back. He did that so I could have all of this. Amen. Since he went to so much trouble, I'm going to do my best to believe it. And to partake in it all. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I want to be a pickle, not a cucumber. Amen. When somebody bites into me, I want to smile. Now remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, teaching the fruit, when I had the fruit bowl up here. The only way you know what the fruit tastes like, the only way the fruit of the Spirit comes out of you, somebody's got to what? you got to be bit. It's easy to display the fruit in here. Everybody's smiling, everybody's in church, everything's wonderful. On the way home, somebody pulls out in front of you and does 30 when it's a 65 mile an hour zone. What are they going to taste when they do that? Are they going to taste this? Or are they going to taste a bit? Everybody understand where I'm coming from? Okay? Because the true fruit of God can only come out when you're bitten, or when you're hurt, or when you're cut, or when you're bruised. That's the only way you get into the fruit. You've got to cut into the fruit. You've got to bite into the fruit. You've got to open that fruit up. That fruit has to be wounded before it can be tasted up. That's why he said... That for us to be like Jesus, he said in, in Romans chapter 8, he said, And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his 
suffering. We have to suffer the recourse of the sinner for him to share the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. This is the gospel nobody wants to teach or hear because none of us wants to suffer without retaliation. Amen? Right. Amen? Right. Be honest. Yeah. It's the truth. But if we're going to be a pickle, a pickle ain't going to bite you back. It's going to submit and share what's inside of it when you bite into it. Amen? Amen. And the benefits that's in it is going to go into the person that bites it. Amen? That's the difference between being a Christian and being a baptized Christian. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. Anybody can be baptized in water. Anybody can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen? It's just as easy. What do you have to do to be baptized in water? You got to get in first. Then what do you do? You have to put yourself in the preacher's hands. You got to let them be in control. I watched Free Chapel's baptism the other day. They had a baptism Sunday last Sunday. I love to watch their baptism. Pastor Jensen takes, he puts them under. He don't do like I got to. I put them under, wait for the bubbles to come out. Then I bring them back. Aren't you glad you already been saved and baptized? I just want to make sure they get it. I want to make sure it sticks. When the bubbles come out and they start kicking, I pull them back up. I know it's stuck then. But see, they just turn loose. They do this. And the preacher does the rest. When you do this, you're putting yourself in the hands of the Holy Spirit and He does the rest. There's no work or effort on your part. All you've got to do is surrender. You get in the water and the water's fine. Matter of fact, you drink that stuff, that's good for you. Take you a tablespoon every day and see what happens. That's good stuff. Amen? You get in that, the water's fine. It's okay. Everybody understand where I'm coming from? Let's, let's go on. Let's, let's look, look at the page, top of page three. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to ask me about that. Can we, test, can, we, can we taste test what you're saying? We'll open them and taste it in a minute. Let's look at verse. Let's look at top of top of page three. Beware. Everybody, read this out loud. Beware of imposters who display counterfeit works. Now, here's the problem. Let's read Second Corinthians 11, 12, and fifteen. But I will continue doing what I've always done. This will undercut those who are looking for an opportunity to boast that their work is just like ours. These people are what? They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I am not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as what? Read it out loud. Servants of what? Aha! Uh -huh. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. Not read the bullet point. Read it out loud. Read it out loud like you want everybody to hear. Not everyone who speaks in tongues, claims to prophesy, claims to have new revelations, or claims to be a teacher or preacher of God is authentic. What you have just tasted and bitten into are what is commonly known as kerosene pickles. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about about kerosene pickles? Anybody Andy Griffith thinks? Oh, yeah. Anybody ever seen the, the episode of Andy Griffith where Aunt B made homemade pickles and she made a, 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 a what do you call it? A truckload of them and gave them to everybody she knew and then she always said, open it up and taste it and see if you like it. And they had to, they had to oh yeah, I mean, it's great. And then afterward, there was, and Andy and, and uh, Barney are talking about them. And, and they said, but I think Andy said something about, if I have to eat another one of them pickles. And Barney said, yeah. And one of them said, they said, these things taste like kerosene. They call them kerosene pickles. Kerosene cucumbers. Kerosene cucumbers. Thank you. Kerosene cucumbers. There are kerosene cucumbers. Now this is what we're looking at. This is what we're studying. There 
are authentic, born again, baptized in the Holy Ghost Christians, then there are kerosene cucumbers. Now, the kerosene cucumber can speak in tongues like you've never heard before. Boy, I mean, they can lay it on. They'll prophesy. Every one of their prophecies are gloom and doom. They're always about tearing you down and how bad things are going to happen to you. They'll speak in tongues make you feel like you want to crawl on the beach. Oh, they'll do all these wonderful things. But look at what Jesus says about them. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do what? The will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Bullet point. So how does Jesus weed out the counterfeit from the authentic? How does he do it? Well, read the next one. Matthew 7, 17 through 20 tells us. In the same way, every good tree bears what? Okay. But the bad tree bears what? Now there's a difference between the fruit and the works. Everybody understand this? What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. What is it? Faith. Huh? Faithfulness, goodness. Okay? That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit of the authentic. But the works... There's nine works. And everybody wants the works. They want to speak in tongues. They want to give out message in tongues. They want to interpret tongues. They want to prophesy. They want to have a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. They want to have super faith. They want to have all these works. They want to lay hands on the sick. They want to cast out those, all these different things. But they are the meanest, nastiest people you ever see in your life if they're ever bitten. Everybody understand this? Yeah. Matthew 7, 17. Look at verse 18. A good tree is not able to bear what? Bad fruit. bad fruit. Nor a bad tree able to bear what? Good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will recognize them by their speaking in tongues? By their what? Their fruit, love, joy, peace, so forth and so on. Amen? Words of Jesus. Bullet point. Jehovah's law of creation separates darkness from light. Satan cannot reproduce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He's not able to mimic the work. He is able to mimic the works of the Holy Spirit through a counterfeit Christian. But he cannot. Everybody say cannot. Mimic the fruit of the divine nature. You can't do it. You can fake speaking in tongues. A lot of people do. You can't fake love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness. That can't be faked. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're bitten, cut, hurt, when you suffer. Because when you suffer, that's when the fruit comes out. When you're bitten, that's when you taste and see and know that it's authentic with God. Didn't he say taste and see that the Lord is good? Yeah. The only way you know is if you get bit. And there are a lot of people claiming to prophesy and speak in tongues and claiming to baptize the Holy Spirit, but they get bit and act just like the devil and just like the world. They ain't more baptized by the Holy Spirit than the man in the moon. Because when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the first thing the Holy Spirit does is he starts to change you from the inside out. He makes you nice and everybody's going, why in the world, what, what's wrong with you? How oh, you used to be so mean, what happened? If he was here right now, I'd have him stand up. I'd give you Danny Washburn as an example. If you know Danny Washburn, those of you who don't know Danny Washburn, 
You're missing out. He was as mean as a snake. And he got baptized. He got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he's one of the nicest, sweetest people. I go into his shop. I try to go in every Friday to his place and talk to him. And he, he'll and I'll be standing there, tears streaming down his face. I, him and I both but have our hands raised, praising the Lord. And customers come walking in. He don't care. He will finish the conversation. They can stand there. Because he was going to talk about God. He said they need to listen to it. Too. <laughs> it ain't the same day as it used to. It's authentic. Everybody understand where I'm coming from? He's been pickled. Danny's been pickled. Truly. He's been pickled. See, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's authentically God. Just because of throw out the tongues, that's fine, well, and good. But if somebody bites you and you cuss them out, you ain't got no tongue. You're accountable. Amen. Can we close this out? Y'all ready to close out? Man, I'm right on time today. I hadn't even cashed in on the I hadn't even cashed in on the credit yet. Now, he touched their eyes, saying, Let it be done according to your faith, and their eyes were opened. Mark 16, 17 through 18 says, These signs will accompany those who what? Believe. believe. Those who believe. You're going to cast out demons in my name, speak in new languages, be able to handle snakes with safety, drink ye poisonous thing. It ain't going to hurt you if you do it by accident. Don't do it on purpose. They will be able to place hands on the sick and they will be healed. Bullet point. This statement of Jesus is not a condemning rebuke. It is an invitation to a divine partnership with the Trinity to live life and live it more abundant. What would you rather eat? Pickles or cucumbers? To me, pickles are more abundant. Okay. Amen? Look at the last thing. 1 Corinthians 7 through 9. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, because the Holy Spirit's in you. You got all the gifts. Even if you've never spoken in tongues, you got all the gifts. They're right there. If you've never prophesied. Can I tell you one more thing? I'm going to jump ahead just a minute, but the Holy Spirit's prompted me to tell you this. Nobody has the gift of tongues. Nobody has the gift of teaching. Nobody has the gift of prophecy. Nobody has the gift of tongues and interpretation. Nobody has the gift of anything. You have the Holy Spirit. And 1 first, first Corinthians 13, 14 tells us the Holy Spirit will use you in the gifts as He wills. Whenever He deems fit that the need is there, He will use you in that. You don't have this gift. I got it, you don't. Nah, nah, nah. That's the way it's been presented by a lot of people. I, hey, I can process. I got this. You ain't got nothing. First of all, you ain't got no fruit, so you ain't got nothing. Y'all don't mind if I preach a little bit, do you? You don't have the gift of, you have the gift, who is the Holy Spirit. And you get the gift when you get born again. He's in you the day you said yes to Jesus. The day you said yes to Jesus, you got all the prophecy, the, all the nine gifts are right there in you, in your heart, right? Every person in here has been born again to God. They're right there. All the fruit's right there. You just got to submit. You got to say, I'm yours. Put me in the jar, Holy Spirit, and cover me up and change what I am. Take me from cucumber to table. Amen? Everybody get it? Is this good? Did y'all get anything today? Does this help you today? Well, let's come to the altar and let's pray. I can, I can go on and on and on, but I'd worry you. I'd, I'd get you tired, and my time is up. It's time to do a little praying. Let's have a little fun at y'all. We'll pray and let the Holy Spirit minister and then we'll shake hands and have a lovely day.
So we're saying we agree with this. Does everybody agree with this pickle message? I don't want to be a kerosene pickle. I don't want to be a cucumber. I want to be a pickle. Okay? And I don't think y'all ever forget this. I, this is what my idea. This is what God gave me. I have personal preference, but some people like dill, some people sweet, some people like bread and butter. I like the salty stack, the salty sappers. That's what those are, salty sappers. Cost of pickles, so to speak. Except they're better because they're hot. Okay? Yeah. They're hot. They're not as hot to me, but I I've I've burned my belt like eating hot stuff, so they're good. All right. So this is what Jesus did for us. And he did it through his sacrifice on the cross. Aren't you glad he did that? Amen. Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us. We thank you that because of your sacrifice, now we can understand the truth and we can live what you gave us to live. We can be the sons and daughters of God, like you said. You said that as you are, so will we in this world. So we receive the gift of communion with you. We thank you for the bread. The bread is blessed and it is the body of the Lamb of God. And we receive the body of the Lamb of God into our body, joining us together so that our body is an extension of the body of Christ in this world. This world needs you, Jesus, and I'm asking you to help us to be the salt and the light. Help us to be what this pickle is. It's salt. The pickle is salt, and it's sweet, and it's vinegar, and it's all the things the world needs, and it preserves, and it helps. God, will help us to be that salt and that preservative that the world needs, and we thank you for it. This we do in remembrance of you. Father, we thank you so much for the blood of your son Jesus, and we thank you that you were willing to give him up to get us. You loved us so much that you gave your only begotten son. That whosoever believes on you shouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. For you sent Jesus into the world not to condemn the world, but so that the world through him could be saved. And we're saved by the blood of one. But also the Spirit of God is the life force of God. Therefore, the blood represents the Spirit as well. Because when we're saved, we receive the Spirit of God. So we have the Spirit of God living in us. And your Spirit is all God all the time. And everything that is God is in us. We have everything that you are in us. We have the total sum of your being in us. We are carriers of your glory. And everywhere we go, you go. Everything we do, you do. Every part of our life, you're part of it. And I'm asking you to help us to realize this and let it be a realization to us that we carry you with us everywhere we go. And so that everything we do, you're involved with because you love us so much. And you promise you'd never leave us or forsake us.